faculty in 2014. Uh, he completed his oral surgery specialty in 2018 from Kaunas Hospital, oral and maxillofacial uh, surgery department. He is uh, a student instructor there at the Department of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery uh, at Lithuanian Health Sciences. And he's been practicing uh, oral surgery there in the hospital as well as in private practice. He is an international instructor, moderator, and lecturer focusing on topics such as immediate implant placement and tissue regeneration. Earlier this year, uh, Dr. Kuperschlag published a study that we are very proud of uh, under the title Ato Autogenous Dentin Grafting of Osseous Defects Distal to Mandibular or Second Molar. Check it out. If you get a chance, you can download it from our website or from uh, a number of other, other websites. I'm sure you're going to really enjoy the presentation. Uh, Dr. Kuperschlag, go ahead. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Amit. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So first of all, I want to thank everybody who, who's here. You know, uh, we're a little bit here in Lithuania, back to, to real life, I want to say. Um, finally, we've been under quarantine since March 14th. And uh, on Monday this week, uh, we came back to work. So it's actually the longest uh, I've ever been without work, I've been on a vacation, let's call it like this, for uh, two months and I'm very happy to be back and very happy to be there, to be here with you guys uh, to share uh, a few ideas. So let's, on, let's start right in. So what's on today's agenda? We'll be discussing grafting materials, the pros and cons. Why should I choose denting as a grafting material? We'll discuss shortly and briefly about PRF or more um, about LPRF. Then we will discuss the indications for using denting uh, for grafting. Uh, the indications are as uh, such the ridge and pro uh, socket preservation, immediate implant placement, impacts at third molars, and I will show you, share some cases with you, hopefully um, with some uh, tips and tricks, uh, so everybody can take something practical from this uh, lecture. Okay, so let's start with discussing for what do we use biomaterials. So uh, the obvious reason is for socket and ridge preservation when we extract a tooth and we don't go for uh, immediate implant placement, we graft it. Uh, in this case, we cover it with, um, with the LPRF membrane and uh, we prepare uh, the site for a future implant placement. Uh, very uh, common uh, in daily practice. Of course, we're talking also about are we using it uh, in uh, lateral or vertical uh, augmentation, such as in this case where we are using a classical uh, sausage technique. Uh, we have a collagen membrane uh, fixated with the uh, two pin tags. Then we're using some kind of biomaterials, closing up the membrane. And on top of that, I'm placing my LPRF membrane. We will discuss it later because this is a question that, that we often get should I choose uh, to place the LPRF membrane directly on the graft and above it on the collagen if collagen is being used or first collagen and, and uh, PRF after? And I put it as the final layer and we'll discuss why I think that it makes a lot of sense. Also, uh, when placing immediate implants, uh, we have a jump gap um, in between the implant wall and the buccal wall, as we can see here, we have an osteotomy for the implant. We have an implant placed, then we graft uh, the area to prevent, uh, let's call it, from the, the, the buccal collapsing of the buccal wall. We know that um, an implant has to have at least uh, two millimeters of bone buccally. So in order to prevent uh, this, um, this resorption, we just uh, augment the jump gap. And I am a big fan of the immediate implant placement. I think that in my practice, about 70% of the implants I place are uh, immediate. And most of the time today, using the, the technology and the knowledge, we uh, prefer to go for immediate implant placement. It's good for us. It's good for our patients. Uh, the patients are very happy with that. As long as we can guarantee the, the same uh, quality of results, 
everyone is very, very happy. So also in this case, we close it with a PRF poncho. I will show you how to do it and so on. This is another case of, a, we can call it either jump gap in combined with socket preservation. This is an upper uh, first molar that's been extracted. So we have three sockets uh, for each of the roots and uh, we uh, graft it. In this case, we fabricate the individual healing abutment and uh, maintain all the beautiful co contours that uh, nature has given. Now, uh, this topic is something uh, that, that Amit mentioned, and always when I'm talking about grafting ex uh, sockets of extracted wisdom teeth, everyone is looking at me, why would you do it? And we will discuss it um, a little bit more in depth as the lecture goes on. Uh, but uh, the main idea is that the surgery itself is quite aggressive. A lot of uh, bone uh, removal is needed. Therefore, we're living with a defect distal to the second molar. We want to prevent it uh, from uh, being a problem in the future. So we will uh, graft the area and I will discuss it more thoroughly. I think that uh, this is one of these topics that people are thinking, perfect, how come uh, I didn't think about it? And, and it's very much, um, suitable for everyday practice. So uh, discussing grafting materials, uh, we have a few grafting materials and each one of them has their pluses and minuses. Uh, so we, when we all started learning about GBR, we were all very much uh, uh, taught that the golden standard is autogenous bone. Uh, the reason for it is that uh, it's pretty much the only grafting material that's both osseoinductive and osseoconductive. Also, the immune response uh, reacts uh, completely different uh, to it, so we have a uh, reduced risk of of um, of uh, the, the graft being ejected uh, from, from our uh, immune system, and uh, it has a fast turnover, and we get real bone. This is real, true host bone. However, uh, it's uh, requiring of a second surgical site uh, for harvesting. Usually we do it from the ramus and um, it's quite technique sensitive because uh, to harvest the block and place it properly, you need to know uh, what you're doing. And that, that's a good thing. We don't want uh, uh, people just to do whatever they want. Uh, if something is, is technically difficult, then, then uh, it's a good motivation uh, for, uh, for improvement. Talking about allogenic bones, so uh, it, it's harvested from human uh, cadavers through a donor bank. It has a fast to medium turnover. It contains some BMPs, bone morphogenic proteins. It's osseoconductive, osseo not inductive. However, and what I find to be uh, the biggest uh, minus uh, with it is that the long-term stability is quite uh, unpredictable. Uh, not only in my hands, a lot of authors even uh, claim that in the period of five years, we have up until uh, potentially 30% uh, resorption. So in my hands, especially when it comes down to blocks, it's uh, very high, uh, very unpredictable, but uh, for the long run, for the short term, for, for the short term, I remember I started using allogenic as my first material. When I reopened, I thought, wow, this, this is amazing. And three, four years later, when I used to see the, the, the patients, I already, uh, begin to see some sh shrinkage. So, of course, we have the xenograft, uh, which can be from cow, from pig. Uh, they have a very high contact of minerals, and they have either no turnover or very slow. The thing with them is that they are fillers, they're volume uh, maintainers, and we don't have real, true bone formation. Uh, we have uh, some network of of, uh, of uh, fibers of cells in between, but because the bone does not resorb, uh, we don't really get real bone. We get a bony-like substance, something that uh, everyone who's working with xenograft knows that when you reopen, you find a lot of floating particles that are just there, but they're not connected to anything. You just take a curette and you know, uh, and you just scrape them off. So um, as we see no material is perfect. And of course, uh, we have the synthetic that I haven't really discussed. I think that synthetic potentially is the future of GBR. However, uh, we're not there yet. And we need to, to be very careful when, when using it uh, because companies 
uh, they promise the world and beyond. However, so far research has been uh, very minimal. So it has the potential, I, in my opinion, we're not there yet. So obviously uh, the autograft, uh, the autologist bone is um, the, the gold standard as we discussed. Now, what if I told you that you can use uh, autologous bone graft with a slow resorption rate that's similar to xenograft, but it doesn't require a secondary surgical site? Well, uh, today with uh, Cometa Bio, we can, and all we need to do is uh, press a button. So uh, in 1967, uh, Tim with uh, Urist, uh, from uh, from California, had first discovered that uh, dentin contains monophogenetic proteins and growth factors that are quite similar to to human bone. In 2003, in South Korea, it was first described by Kim and uh, his colleagues uh, as a grafting material for an open sinus lift. Now, uh, looking at the the properties of dentin. So it has obviously inorganic and unorganic components. We all studied that in first or second year of dental school. Uh, these components are quite similar to those of human bone. The inorganic context of dentine is about 70%, 70 to 75 uh, sometimes, and uh, the organic context is about 20% versus the alveolus, which has an inorganic context of 65 and organic uh, content of, of 25. Now, what's also very important is that at least 90% of the organic content of dentin is type one collagen. Okay, these collagen fibers are very much uh, important for us. Uh, they play an important role in bone formation and mineralization. And as we already know from the 60s, back then, uh, even before Woodstock in 67, that uh, dentin contains uh, bone morphogenetic protein. So the properties of dentin are there. Now, how did I came across uh, dentin grafting? So here's a picture of me as a student. I had uh, more hair, unfortunately, than now. And uh, I remember I came across this uh, literature review from a Korean team. Um, and uh, I was just blown away. I mean, I read that dentin is very similar to um, to bone, but what blew me away is that we have the, the, the potential of taking medical waste, yeah, because we as, as uh, dentists, as surgeons, uh, extract thousands of teeth a year. And instead of throwing that tooth out, we can put it back in. And not only the fact that uh, it saves us money, but the, the result is second to none. It's autogenous grafting material. And I thought to myself, this is amazing. I was in fourth year um, and this motivated me to do my uh, thesis, uh, my final thesis about uh, dentin and its uh, grafting uh, potential. And I thought to myself, why doesn't everyone use it? How come we're not funding it? And um, there's a small new ones that back in the day in, in uh, Korea, they had a tooth bank, meaning that if you want to uh, use an extracted tooth for grafting, you gave it away via courier, via mail, whatever. Uh, they demineralize it, they sterilize it, and you got it back. So this is very much, um, let's call it, uh, this, this process doesn't make sense uh, from a clinical point of view, because if we said that we're using GBR, we were using grafting, for socket and ridge preservation for immediate implant placement, then we cannot use it because immediate implant placement out of the roof, famous socket uh, preservation. So about 70%, 80% maybe of our indications have just been out of the, the window. So yeah, that, that, that's why not everyone is using it. Now, I always like to show this video and uh, I consider myself to be a donkey. I work as a, as a donkey. And um, we are usually led in a herd uh, by opinion leaders, by companies who promises a lot of things. But sometimes like this black donkey, uh, all we need to do is use some common sense and we will find a very easy solution. So sometimes all we need to do is just remove the hurdle. 
this is what Cometa Bio, Bio uh, came. I contacted the, them a long time ago. They, they were very small. Uh, Amit obviously wasn't there yet. And uh, I told them, listen, I want to I wanna get the kit. And they said, perfect. Uh, how did you hear about us? But I Googled. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Like, no one, uh, no one uh, recommended us? I said, no, I just came across with you guys. Uh, because I did my thesis work on, on Dentin and I remember they were very surprised. Really? Like, yes, yes. So come on, give me and, 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 and give me the, the, the kit. And I remember I just showed it to everybody and I was very, very happy about it. And I started using it pretty much uh, after uh, dental school and I've been using it ever since. So ever since pretty much the beginning of Cometa Bio. Um, the big uh, let's say progress that, that uh, Cometa Bio brings to the table is the fact that you can take an extracted tooth and turn it into a, gra a grafting material within seven to eight minutes. How do you do it? Well, very easily, you take uh, the, the extracted teeth, you use a carbide tungsten or just a hard burr, don't use the diamond burr, you clean out all the carriers, all the filling materials, um, uh, all the, the PDL remnants, dry it off with, with the gauze, put it into the chamber, grind it, and sorry, it takes 13 seconds. I, uh, I did that uh, process twice to make sure that everything gets ground up. So 26 sec seconds in total. Then I apply a, uh, a cleanser, and this is where Cometa Bio had their uh, breakthrough. They found uh, a, a cleaning solution that actually, um, I don't think that sterilizes uh, is sterilizing is, is the right uh, word, but autogenous graft doesn't have to be sterile, it has to be bacteria free, it has to be virus free, especially today, and uh, it has to be fungi free. And I saw the report, the lab report, the first one, they don't even have it in Cometa Bio because it was only when they, they started and, and I was just blown away. So we apply uh, the, the cleanser for five minutes, let it rest. We take a gauze, we soak up as much uh, fluid as we can, we throw away that gauze, and we apply a buffing solution to increase and to uh, put back the pH into normal levels. So we just um, fill it up for one second. You don't have to time it. Again, um, we take a gauze, we soak it up, and repeat the process with, with, the, with the buffing solution, and voila, we have a perfectly uh, clean, uh, disinfected uh, grafting material ready to use. So um, what are the clinical problems if I want to use an extracted tooth as a grafting material? Uh, first of all, we have to get the correct size of granule. What about carious and bacterial infiltration? Because if the tooth is in the oral cavity, we should expect uh, some uh, bacterial infiltration, even if it's not, uh, if it doesn't have any carious on it and can all extract the teeth be used as a grafting material. So first of all, uh, getting the correct granule size. So uh, I wanna get uh, pretty much this size of granules between 250 to 1,200 microns. The reason I don't wanna go bigger than 1,200 is that I like my graft to be smaller. It's more, uh, more malleable. It has less sharp edges. I always use medium to small a size granules uh, in my graft regarding to whatever graft it is. And I don't want it to be smaller than 250 microns because then it can go through phagocytosis and just uh, resorb completely and disappear. So how to achieve it? By pressing a button, this chamber pretty much does it for us. It has a filtering system and uh, you just get the, the, perfect, right, uh, the perfect size of granules every time. Now, uh, what about uh, bacteria? Well, uh, just like I said, we have a disinfec disinfection solution, a cleanser, and this is where, uh, again, where their, their breakthrough is, because if you look at the chamber, sorry, the chamber is pretty much a smart uh, coffee grinder, but uh, how to clean it and to prepare it, this is the, the, the main idea, and it comes in bottles. It's very easy to use, all you need to do is fill it up. You wait five minutes, like I said, you soak it up, you apply the PBS, the, the buffing solution, you soak it up and apply it again and you're ready to go. 
five, six minutes, well, let's say six minutes. And um, of course that the endodontically treated teeth are con contraindicated because of the, of the um, guta pelka and the, and the fillers. However, uh, seeing uh, Ziv Mazov and other people's uh, webinars uh, and sharing opinions, it actually makes sense that uh, what they do is that they just take a burr, section the tooth in the middle and just shave off all of this, maybe a little bit, uh, uh, maybe a millimeter or two of uh, sound dentin they sacrifice, but uh, then they, they, they uh, use the endodontically treated uh, root after all of this area, all of this material has been removed with a burr. Uh, makes sense, uh, and I'm going to try it on Monday actually. And uh, it will be interesting maybe to form, uh, to figure out a very exact protocol on how to do it. Uh, so we might have a little task uh, in front of us, Amit. Keep it in mind. Now, um, being autogenous, I also uh, like to combine LPRF. So uh, the main objective of LPRF is to achieve new angiogenesis. Now, I'm not going to talk into too much detail about LPRF. You can see Nelson Pinto's uh, webinar about it. Nelson is Professor Pinto. I shouldn't call him Nelson. Is the guy, uh, the top researcher in the world, I think, today about this. But just in a few words, how I uh, implement it. Uh, in, in my daily life. So uh, it releases growth factors up to seven days. It, uses, it, it is used as a matrix and recipient for growth factors. It doesn't resort, it epithelializes. okay? This is why I always leave it as a last layer because if I even have a little bit of a dehiscence, uh, then I still have a layer of, um, of LPRF that will protect my graft and it will eventually epithelialize and uh, I will get a new keratinized ginger on it. And also, it's very important that it has antibacterial properties. We'll never see any plaque accumulation to it. So this is why if I have some dehiscence and uh, it is covered with an LPRF, I can uh, uh, sleep well at night and also I'm a patient. We know that if we didn't use it, if we see collagen, uh, uh, wound dehiscence and collagen, then stop remove everything, wait, and, and start over. LPRF uh, gives me that, that, that extra safety. Practically speaking, how do I use it? I use it in a puncture technique. Very simple. I just puncture a hole, place it uh, in a, um, place my uh, healing abutment in it, like a poncho. This is an immediate implant placement case. And um, just tuck it in. Please uh, note, uh, of course, these uh, granules were removed. Please note these defects, okay? Obviously, we have a defect. And five days post-op. And this is something that is 100% predictable and can be achieved by anybody. And it, this is the main, main and most important thing. And I, during this quarantine, I got to see a lot of webinars of gods of implantology and gods of stereo. And, and they showed cases that really, Five people in the world can perform. I cannot perform that. But this is something that everyone can achieve. And it is very predictable. Also, uh, we can use LPRF uh, together uh, with dentin to form a dentin block, sticky bone, steak bone, however you want to call it. Um, it looks like this is very, very malleable, very easy to use, and gives a lot of confidence when you use it, you can find the protocols, I think, in, in Cometa Bio's uh, website. So Ziv Mazor uh, has called it green dentistry, when, when we use dentin uh, together with, um, with the LPRF, and I, I find this uh, name to be very, very accurate of what we're doing. I love it, and uh, I'm going to refer to it from now on as green dentistry, because it's pretty much a, pretty much describes what we're doing. We're taking medical waste, we're taking something from the patient's own blood, and we're mixing it up, and we're getting this wonderful material. Uh, and yeah, we're, we are green, so uh, green dentistry, and go green dentistry. This is a short case uh, of, uh, of a big uh, work that we did. We extracted uh, impacted wisdom teeth, here a second molar, replaced an implant, 
and grafted everything with dentin. On top of that, we place our ponchos and a few uh, LPRF membranes. And this is post-op. This is immediately post-op, and you can now go like this with your nose and think, Avi, why are you showing this garbage to us? Look how it looks. It, it looks terrible. Believe in green dentistry. This is five, maybe seven days post-op, not more than seven days. Look at the volume. Look at the color of the tissue. This is wonderful. Again, before and after. And this is something, you see, it's a very bloody surgery. You cannot say that uh, only I can achieve it. Really, anyone who will follow these principles will have a predictable outcome. So uh, being green and being autogenous, so in this case, we extracted the tooth, we grinded it up, filled it, and uh, placed an LPRF plug. On top of that, we placed a Maryland and waited uh, for, for the site to heal in order for us to place implants in the future. What about immediate implant placement? Well, I'm a big fan of dense birds of off identification. Look how nice I'm able uh, to expand the septa, the septum. Okay, from here to here. And again, predictability is the key here. This is 100% predictable. So uh, we have expanded the septum. We used the dentin particles, grafted the area, form show, and the patient is ready to go. I don't even have to use a huge healing abutment, although uh, today I prefer to either use an individual one or to use a bigger one. Now, uh, being autogenous and being green, what about the preservation of osseous defects after wisdom teeth extraction? So as Amit mentioned, uh, we've published an article and this article uh, is getting a lot of attention now. Uh, and the article describes the uh, grafting of osseous defects right after, uh, of osseous defects distal to the, to the second molar tooth right after impact of wisdom tooth extraction and why we should do it. So uh, what's, what's the point of it? Uh, so uh, basically the horizontally uh, impacted wisdom teeth, they as is require uh, quite of a aggressive surgery, okay? This is what we have is it's regardless of technique. Of course, technique can improve it. But when uh, the tooth is completely covered by bone, we need to remove that bone. There's nothing that we can do. So as is, uh, the, the, the amount of uh, bone removal is quite large. Now, due to the large osteotomy, we will leave an osseous defect distal to the second molar. Imagine the distal root. Here we had the wisdom tooth. And now it's gone and we have a big defect. So uh, the literature shows us, uh, Kugelberg and, and colleagues show us that uh, five years, three years follow up will um, occur, will, will, will end up, will result with, with four to seven millimeters of a pocket, of a terial pocket, periodontal pocket. And this, this is already serious stuff. Now we imagine the patients that we're dealing with are young patients, most of them, right? The, most of the patients who are coming to extract uh, these uh, impacted uh, wisdom teeth are young. They have 80 or 100 years more to live, and we're causing a defect. We're causing a pathology. So um, the thing is that as oral surgeons, for example, my uh, practice uh, is very much um, uh, based on referrals or on referred patients. I get the patient, I do the surgery, maybe I meet him again uh, the week after to remove the sutures, to check the healing, and then he disappears. And I don't think about it anymore. But we need to understand the fact that as is, not because we're bad doctors, but because of the surgery itself, we're leaving a defect that in the future will be a pathological problem from a perio point of view to the patient. So uh, we can see this case, for example, here, we don't have any bone, okay? Uh, if we look at the distal, we can take a probe. We will have maybe um, two millimeters or three millimeters of, of pocket, which is normal, but 
It is because we get a stoppage of the probe with some fibrous tissue from the crown of, of the impacted wisdom tooth. When we remove it, what will happen? For sure, we will have a huge defect. So uh, we will get to this uh, case a little bit uh, more in detail. We just graft it up and we have very nice healing and uh, we reduce the risk of uh, pocket and I will show you for, for how much. So uh, our study was done uh, with, um, with follow-up three months post-op and a year post-op. Uh, we uh, took in total 24 cases Okay, um, and uh, we invited them for a follow-up in uh, three months. Uh, we did the uh, probing of, of the area. We did the uh, um, uh, panoramic x-rays. And uh, again, we repeated the same process uh, 12 months full stop. And look what we found. The study group, uh, the group that has been uh, grafted, the, the, the control group, wasn't grafted, just normal standard surgery. We found a pocket depth of 1.15 millimeters. That, that's awesome, that's a great number because the physiological depth is from one to two millimeters. The control group demonstrated 4.45 millimeters of depth. Okay, so this is correlating with the literature. Look at the difference, 4.45 4, 4, 4 within a year. It's a big number. Within five years, it will turn into five, six, and seven, for sure. But uh, the, the study group, it will be stable. It will be stable because we have turnover. It's a slow turnover, but it will end up turning over and turning into real host bone, which is amazing. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, the patient can go on living their life. So basically we have a new paradigm here, uh, taking medical waste and turning it into uh, 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 amazing grafting materials, thus improving our patient's comfort, reducing the risk for future presentation. This is something that is uh, standard today in my office. Not enough. Now let's uh, talk a little bit about green dentistry. Let's show a few cases. Uh, so this is the case that I showed you before. This lady uh, was uh, given an uh, immediate implant in, uh, in, in the first uh, lower molar area by me. At that time, she didn't want to do anything with, with, with these teeth. She disappeared, came back within a few months, and we already had some exudate from, um, uh, from the impact of the tooth. She's a lady in her four, in her fifties. I said, you know, uh, and she came. Okay, let's let's uh, finish uh, this implant. I said, I'm very sorry, but uh, it will be highly irresponsible to finish it up without addressing these. So either we do something, we extract these two teeth, we place another implant here, or if you don't want, we can leave it like this. However, I uh, I advise to place an implant. Or, I mean, you have the implant passport, you have uh, all, all the document, all the documentation. You can find a, do a different doctor that will take it. She said, no, I trust you. Let's get it done. So uh, we raised the flap here. Uh, look at the, um, at the impaction angle. Look at the second tooth. So the second tooth is like this. This one goes completely buccally. Okay, it's not even horizontal. It's like laterally impacted. Of course, elderly lady, we had to do some work. It was ankylosed in some areas, but uh, nothing too serious. Then we end up with this medical waste, which turns into a beautiful grafting material. We place an implant, we graft this area. Again, membrane, suture, this is uh, a few days after, and this is a few months after we finalized the case. This is why we do this. This is why we want to achieve this beautiful emergence profile. Now, if we look at the x-rays, where is, and uh, I didn't have the chance to uh, get, uh, because of the corona, uh, to get the proper um, screenshot. So all I have is the photos from, from my computer. But look at this. Where's the host bone? Where's the dentin? You cannot tell. And this is about 
two and a half months after. I didn't wait for half a year for a year. Two and a half months. Where is the host bone? It's that simple, that fast. Where is the host bone? Where is the dentin? We cannot see the difference. This shows the integration uh, of, of, of the grafting material. So amazing result. Keeping it green, again, this lady came uh, to replace these teeth with implants. Of course, the wisdom teeth had to be extracted. We have pericornitis quite active in all uh, four wisdom teeth. So um, what do we do? We go green, we extract these teeth, we extract the wisdoms, and we have beautiful grafting material. This is the clinical uh, situation. So of course, nothing much to, to advise. This is the wisdom tooth, quite a simple extraction. Usually when we see this, uh, this uh, lesion in the distal, we know that the tooth should uh, come out quite easily and we just apply a luxator here and it comes out from the distal area. This is how it was. We extracted, we extracted. This is our beautiful grafting material. We place the implants with ponchos. We graft the area with, uh, with dentine and uh, we have a wonderful long-term result. Now keeping it green, another patient, uh, this patient came for entire mouth. Of course, we don't have much choice here. All these teeth need to be taken out. And um, he, did, he couldn't afford a fixed uh, dental work in this case. So we decided to uh, go for extractions, immediate implant placement. We will place uh, in every jaw three implants and we will do an overdenture that will be held by, uh, by locate. So uh, good plan. However, unfortunately in this case, we were not able uh, to find any veins. I wasn't able to draw blood. I'm sure that uh, some uh, doctors are more experienced than me, but there was no way to take, to, to draw blood. And of course we want to stay green. I don't want to use any, any collagen. What's good with dentin that it does not encapsulate. So we, do, we don't have to cover it up with some kind of a, of a barrier. A barrier membrane is not needed when uh, using dentin. Knowing this, I uh, approached uh, the surgery. Of course, all of these beautiful teeth are our grafting material. So this is the clinical situation, easy extraction, we clean everything out. Sorry, because uh, we are planning an overdenture in this case, we do some flattening of the ridge with a, with a burr. We place implants regarding to whether we're going uh, to, to, to do a fixed bridge or a removable, uh, prosthetically driven, uh, singular uh, angulated implants from, from the cingulum. This is the second implant, the third implant. And then we take this beautiful grafting material and just cover everything up. No membranes, no nothing. And suture. The plan is like this. In two weeks, we, start, we remove the sutures and the prosthodontists start fabricating uh, the removable prosthesis, which will take about a month. So maybe a month and a half post-op, you will already have a removable prosthesis. Uh, prosthesis, that uh, time of implant uncovery, uh, for him, I think we went for three or three and a half months. We will directly connect it with, with the lo locator. And I have a removable denture already on a grafted area and only a month and a half after we grafted it. But with dentin, I'm sure enough uh, that uh, I'm confident enough uh, that it will not uh, lead to any problem, okay? And this is how I, un I, how I uncover. I had to take a burr and look for it because I couldn't find the implant. Look at this, where is the dentin? What do you think will happen if it was xenograft? We will have flying particles everywhere and regardless to which company you use, okay? Because a cow is a cow. You cannot <laughs> turn it 
a cow to, to a super cow, right? Or, or a pig into a kosher pig, <laughs> into a kosher super pig. So uh, just outstanding result. Look at this bleeding bone. This is what we want to see, okay? And this is what we get every time that we're, talk, we're, we're using dentin. And this is already six months uh, post-op. Uh, we have a nice um, uh, gingiva, nice contours, and everything here looks very nice. This is at the time of, of uncover. Now uh, let's talk about the impact of the third molars. I'll just show you uh, the last case and we can go through the q and A. I I just wanna show you my protocol on how I approach uh, these cases. So first thing that we need to do is uh, we need to analyze the, the X-ray, okay? What we see here, uh, by analyzing, sorry, by analyzing the X-ray, we can figure out the game plan, okay? And when we have a game plan, when we have a, a protocol, Everything is very smooth and very easy. What do I mean? <clears throat> so uh, in this case, we have a tooth with two separate roots, okay? It's uh, partially impacted. We see a little bit of, 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 of the tip, I think. Yeah, we're well, not a little bit, we see the crown in, in the mouth. Um, how will our uh, workflow go? So first of all, we raise the flap. I will show you how I raise the flap, uh, uh, but I always tend to use a very minimal flap. I never go past the papilla of the of the um, of the second molar. I just see enough. Okay, for me it's enough uh, to work, and I don't want to touch the papilla because uh, cutting away the papillary fibers also might lead to some bone loss. Then what I'll have to do is I'll have to do um, a coronectomy. We remove the crown, and then we try to uh, make a purchase point somewhere here. If the tooth doesn't budge, if it doesn't move, then we go in and hemisect it and uh, extract each root separately. So let's uh, take this game plan practically. So this is the situation and this is the flap design. Like I said, I'm going until the first, until, sorry, the mesial papilla of the second molar. And this is what I'm getting. Okay. I don't need a bigger flap. Now notice that the, the incision will always be buccal. I never go mid crustal because of the risk of injuring the lingual nerve. In some cases, uh, we have the lingual nerve go mid crestally some authors even say 17, 80%, 18% of the cases. I practically didn't, never encountered such, such, such uh, statistics. I maybe in my life had four or five cases or three even uh, that, that I actually saw uh, that the lingual nerves is, is mid crestal but I always uh, think that it might be there. So I make the incision buccally. I follow uh, the contour of the sulcuses until the papilla, I do not touch the papilla. And this is more than enough for me. Now I will do a distal and buccal gutter with a diamond, not with a diamond, sorry, with a carbide burr. And I just, this will help me to facilitate uh, the, the elevation of the tooth. Then we followed with a coronectomy, as we said, everything according to plan. Here will be my purchase point. And in this case, very slight elevation. Always remember, do not use force. The risk of, of a mandibular angle fracture is real. Believe me, everyone who's worked in the ER saw it. If you are using force, something is wrong with your technique. An extraction always has to be elegant. And this is what I always say to my students, uh, and to my colleagues, an extraction is like a ballet. If you end up using force, if you're asking your to hold uh, the patient's head, you're doing something wrong. You do not need to, to be uh, using that force that uh, if, of course, if the patient uh, is not under general anesthesia, then it shouldn't move all of his head. And in this case, we were lucky enough to elevate uh, the, the tooth and extract it fully. Beautiful 
grafting material. We clean, we disinfect it, we graft it, and all we need is three or four sutures, and that's it. Very, very simple, and this is common everyday practice in my office. And now we can know that, uh, that uh, the patient will not have future complications. And another uh, small aspect of, of, of the study that, that we found out when we called the patients uh, to, for a suture removal, seven days post-op, they end up filling um, a questionnaire. And one of the question, one of the question also seven, seven days post-op and three months post-op. One of the questions was, uh, did you notice uh, anything different regarding food entrapment? And uh, about 70% or 80%, I don't really remember the, the, the number, right? But, uh, we, we, we will find it in the, in the article. They reported that they had food trapment in the control group, where uh, in, the, um, in the study group, no food trapment. So also the quality of life of the patient is affected by, by doing a very, very small adjustment. Grinding, grafting, it takes a few more minutes. Uh, I usually start with the upper molar I extracted. I let my assistant um, uh, prepare it. And then when I finish with the, with the lower one, I start with the upper one. I mean. And then when I finish with the lower one, I already have the graft. But it's just for workflow. But there's also nothing wrong with just like placing a gauze, uh, letting the patient bite down for six minutes, relax, and then three more minutes where you uh, place the, um, the graft and suture. So uh, great uh, outcomes and uh, improvements of, of quality of life. So thank you for your attention. Um, this is uh, my Facebook, my Instagram, uh, my email. Please feel free to add me on Facebook, follow me on Instagram. If you have any questions, feel, feel free uh, to contact uh, me by email. And uh, please keep in touch. Maybe, maybe some uh, nice cooperations will come. Maybe we'll do some nice course of immediate implant placement. I will gladly come to, to the state for it. You can come to me. We have a, a very nice uh, teaching and learning facility here. And hope to see you and hope you enjoyed. And thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful, wonderful. Dr. Kuperschlag, thank you very much. It was uh, beautiful, perfect. Uh, we did get some questions uh, as you were presenting. I'm gonna go through some questions. We got some questions through the chat here uh, on Zoom and also a few questions through uh, email as well that I just received as well. So the first okay. one is about osteointegration. Um, What's been your experience? I mean, when would you uh, say you're getting full osteointegration of the graft with, uh, with the grafted site? I w um, you know, I will tell you different. We have a way of, of measuring it with OSTO, with, the, with ISQ uh, measurements. And uh, I am very, very confident when it comes down to lower jaw. Uh, to start with the final prosthesis two and a half months post-op, although uh, with, with the implant uh, system that I'm working, I am sure that we can stretch that envelope and even go, let's say, around six weeks top. Mm -hmm. But uh, I feel comfortable, very comfortable of doing it in two and a half months post-op, upper jaw three months, and I just go ahead and finish the case. Yeah, and that's pretty much aligned with what we've seen across the board. We typically recommend uh, if you're doing a, uh, well, actually, let me ask you this. So uh, for a two-stage implant, for a postponed implant placement, you're waiting about eight weeks in a mandible? Or what's, what is the typical timing uh, that you see in a fairly if, healthy if, patient? If healthy patients uh, with, with the implant system that, that I work with, I can do, I can four months or five, uh, four weeks or five weeks, I can already go on and finish the case. Uh, but not many implant place, man, not many implant systems allow us this. Uh, standard implant uh, systems with uh, SLA surface area, I am very comfortable of, uh, of uh, finishing the case two and a half months post-op, very comfortable with that. Mm, 10 okay. weeks, 
more than enough with every impl implant system that, that has an SLA uh, tick area. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we think it, the, the main reason is because it's, uh, it's a, because you get the ankylosis effect. Yeah. Okay. You, you, the ankylosis between dentin and bone, uh, which is obviously different from osteointegration, but as a result, it's giving you the same result. It's giving you the stability that you are looking for. So that's one thing that we've seen from the research. And the second thing relates to it is that we are, when you're using an autologous product, you know, you, you, kept, you kept actually, you kept mentioning it a few times in your lecture, but when you're using an autologous product, a bio material, which is autologous, your body shifts immediately to building, to regeneration. It's not, you, you almost completely jump through the phase of, Try the, trying to figure out what this material is, you know, foreign body, you know, foreign body, how to treat it. Yeah, the, um, you're not seeing it with an autologous graft. Then infl infl inflammatory phase, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I completely, completely agree. And uh, I always say, uh, don't think that you are using dentin. Think autogenous, you are using autogenous. It doesn't matter if it's autogenous bone or autogenous dentin. Uh, use the same mindset. So, uh, by the way, uh, Brennemark called, uh, described first uh, osteointegration as functional ankylosis. Mm -hmm. So it makes a lot of sense uh, in, in, in that manner. Right. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Gilda Dagata, I, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. I'm sorry if I did not. Uh, asking, uh, do you use EDTA uh, to make partial demineralized uh, dentin in order to boost BMP2 bioactivity? So are you using EDTA? I, I know you haven't mentioned it. No, not yet, because I'm waiting for the shipment from you. <laughs> I, I haven't got the chance to. Um, I'll be honest, my results are good, uh, are, are, are good enough. It would be interesting uh, to, to use it for sure. For sure, it will be interesting. It makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, I want to try. Yeah, why, why, why not? However, my, my results are, are great. How, how long uh, is the protocol exist? Uh, uh, the protocol you? has been out for almost two years now. And so I'll, I'll say from our research and from everything we've seen, we have, especially in the U.S., okay, especially in the U.S., uh, because I guess it's closer to us, um, we're seeing more and more doctors using it. And uh, the doctor that was asking the question is absolutely correct. What we are seeing with EDTA is that you are boosting uh, BMP activity and growth factor activity just because you are exposing more of the collagen. So what the EDTA does is an etch EDTA is an etching. It's an etching uh, solu solution, basically taking away a little bit of the mineral exposing more of the collagen, and as a result, exposing more of the BMPs and the growth factors quicker, faster. And so you, we are seeing more, even more, even more bone regenerated when we use EDTA. Now, uh, we tend to recommend to use EDTA for partial demineralized dentin. I, I should just say, for people who are not familiar, we have two protocols. The protocol that Dr. Kuperschlag was referring to is, uh, uh, is to produce mineralized autologous dentin graft, mineralized. With the EDTA, it's a protocol that extends the process by two more minutes, but it is providing you with partial demineralized dentin grafts. You're still getting all the properties of mineralized graft, but you're also getting more exposure of the collagen early on. And so for uh, patients that are, uh, we, let's call them uh, slow healers, like uh, diabetic, medicated, um, old, that you know they're not going to generate bone as, 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 as nicely as a 20-year-old, those are the patients that typically EDTA would work really, really great on, okay? So um, that's Can't wait a, to try it. And the EDTA, she was asking, uh, yeah, the question here is, yeah, the EDTA will extend the protocol by two minutes, okay? So you go five minutes with the dentin cleanser, you dehydrate, then the EDTA for two minutes, dehydrate, and then you wash. So instead of eight minutes, it's taking you 10 minutes, 
but definitely worth definitely worth spending these two minutes for your um, slow healing cases. Okay. Um, question about membrane. So uh, when do you use? Do you always use membrane? First of all, so the question for you is: nope. do You always use membrane. <laughs> when do you not use membrane? And okay. if you don't have PRF, it's a multi. It's a multi question. Uh, yeah. The person was asking. It's, if you it's, don't, first of all, it's a great question, mm -hmm. and it's a very common question. And uh, the answer is very simple. First of all, we need to uh, think for what do we need a membrane. So uh, what is a membrane and for what do we use it? So we basically use it for two, uh, for two uh, indications. The first one is to provide some kind of a barrier in between the infiltration of, of uh, soft tissues, of soft tissue cells or fibroblasts uh, that will lead to an encapsulation of the graft. And basically we'll, we will achieve a granulation tissue and that the graft will not be integrated. The second indication is uh, as a, a container. Uh, we use it in order to stabilize the graft, make sure that it stays exactly where we want it to stay. Uh, for example, in that case that I showed you at the beginning uh, with the pin tag and the cell switch thickness. Now, when uh, you have a large defect and you want to stabilize 100% uh, the graft, then you need to use the membrane for the mechanical properties only for the mechanics but talking about the biological aspect so dentin as i mentioned uh, uh, briefly does not encapsulate so we have sort of a super xenograft uh, that does not encapsulate we do not need a barrier function in, in order for the graft uh, to um, to be integrated and i showed uh, that last case with the three implants and the overdenture there was no membrane no prf no collagen no nothing and the result was quite uh, quite good, excellent actually. And I think it's something very, very predictable. So the answer is, as a membrane, I do not need to use, as a barrier, I'm sorry, I do not need to use a membrane, neither, whether it's a LPRF, whether it's a collagen. However, I prefer to use LPRF because the healing is uh, much nicer. Mm -hmm. But if I need it to contain the graft, to build up for GBR, then we have to use a membrane uh, from the mechanical point of view. Okay. Uh, Dr. Gruberschlag, I have a question for you, which is uh, mm -hmm. I, I usually ask people because in different parts of the world, the reactions are very different. So for the patients you're seeing, uh, do you feel, do you find it's easier for you to convince your patients to undergo bone grafting procedures? I know that patients today are asking a lot of questions and they want to reduce the amount of work that you do for them on them but what about when you present this type of protocol what's the reaction so first of all we are not the first doctor to, to see the patient the first doctor the patient has been diagnosed and treated by dr google so they come knowing everything and it's not a bad thing that, that the patient has, has questions because it helps them to understand what they're going i'm going to go through. now um when i Tell them, listen, what I'm going to do, I'm going to grind up the tooth and, uh, and then I'm going to put it back. To be honest, the first instinct is this eyebrow being raised up. What are you talking about? But then I explain, listen, the tooth and the bone is very similar to composition. Now, let's do an alternative. I will take bone from a cow. I will cover it with a membrane from a pig <laughs> or... I will use our own tooth. Now, please, the decision is yours. What do you want? Nine out of 10, maybe not nine, 95 out of 100 will tell me, okay, let's do it. And uh, it's, it's when you explain it to the patient, they understand it because most of the patients, they go through some kind of extraction uh, during their lifetime. And they know that the extracted tooth, you don't really use it for, uh, for the tooth fairy. You don't really get the money for it. And it's medical waste. What are you talking about with, with using it? Are you trying to, to do some fancy schmancy stuff? No. <laughs> you need to take the extra five minutes to explain this to them. But when you give them the choice between cow, pig, or your own tooth, most of them are uh, very easy in, in, in accepting it. 
Wonderful. And, you know, and I, I think that especially now with the, when we are in COVID-19 era, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you really, you know, patients really don't want to ex get exposed to anything uh, from the outside that they're not, they can't necessarily trust a hundred percent or anything like that yeah okay. i i just had i just had a patient this week that, that i explained to him listen i'm extracting the tooth and instead of throwing out i'm putting it back in somewhere else imagine and he was very much uh, uh appreciative appreciative of it also also we have to say it uh, and this is also a very important uh, issue that the cost uh, to, to, to benefit equation here is, is very high. I mean, uh, and let me just uh, for one minute emphasize about my, my, my uh, article. Uh, mm -hmm. Imagine my hypothesis means that we need to graph the area. We cannot leave it as is. I am not saying that you will not get a good result using allograph. Maybe, most likely, to be honest. However, if I want to use allograph, I need to use at least one CC because the socket, the, the, the defect is big. I must use a collagen membrane. Mm -hmm. And it, I end up charging my patients three times more, at least, mm -hmm. okay, for the same procedure. And they will look at me and they will tell me, listen, what are you talking about? My cousin, my friend, my colleague, uh, most of them are young patients. They cannot afford all of these uh, expensive uh, treatments. Because anyway, most of the money is saved up for the ortho that, 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 that they're going to do. And uh, they, right. they will look at me and they'll tell me, oh, sir, you're a charlatan, you're a thief. Everyone else is taking this amount, X, and you're taking X times three. What the hell? Uh, so Dentine allows me to uh, keep the, the, the price point, the price range in a very, very logical uh, 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 range. And really nine out of ten when you explain to them why when you take the five minutes to explain to them why and guys i have the literature to prove it then they say okay i will pay the extra mm -hmm. because it makes sense mm -hmm. uh, and and then they accept it so we also have a very good uh, cost to value ratio yeah 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 no you are you are 100 percent right i hear the same everywhere i go so it's the same i hear the same exact uh reasoning and the same messaging okay very good so uh, i think with that we're pretty much over time uh again i want to thank first and foremost i want to thank you uh for the wonderful job you've done here very very nice great cases uh beautiful results thank you for having me and hopefully i'll have many more cases in the future and i miss working <laughs> absolutely and again thanks for everyone for joining us Again, Thank there's a lot much. more information on the website. And if you want to read more articles, see more cases, it go to the website, cometabio.com, under science or under education, uh, you will find, you'll find all that. You were going to say what? No, so th th thank you very much, guys. Thank you for, for all the participants. Okay. And hope that you, you find it beneficial and, and, and learning. Yeah. Perfect. And we'd love to hear from you on info at cometabio.com if you want to provide us with some feedback, info at cometabio.com. Very good. And oh, by the way, and the session is recorded and it's going to be on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, probably within the next few days. So you can go back and, and, and watch it again if you wish. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.